year. So good to see everyone. Thanks for joining. Hopefully everyone had a nice restful New Year's and holiday break. I know that I did and I'm excited for this year. I'm really looking forward to it as probably most people are and I'm excited to keep educating all of you on uh, allergies and food allergies and dispelling allergy myths. So let's go ahead and get started. As you know, uh, so far in the series of Live with Dr. Katie, we've been focusing on food allergies. And we're going to continue to do that for a little while. And today we have a special guest who knows a lot about food allergies and what it's like being a mom of a child with food allergies. So we're going to go ahead and get the allergy mom. Let's get Melissa on here. All right, let's see if she's here. All right, let's see if we can get Melissa on here. Oh, there we go. Hi. Oh, <laughs> how are you? So nice to finally virtually meet you. I know, same. Happy New Year. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to chat with you. Me as well. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. I'm going to go ahead and give everyone a little brief synopsis of sort of your background and then we'll just, you know, dig into all the questions and everything. And I just want to say also quick hellos to Maddie Nice 3, Nate Zhang, uh, Caitlin Alexandra Fitzgibbon, oh, and yeah. Mon Mon Mellon. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Okay, so let, let me tell you all about Melissa. Melissa is an author and educational presenter a clinical social worker, psychotherapist, and advocate. As a mother of children with severe allergies, her journey of learning and experiencing the various ages and stages of life with allergies propelled her to create the website and blog at theallergymom.com in 2010. Since then, Melissa has helped provide support and a forum for families to share their experiences as well as finding ways to educate the public about life-threatening food allergies. Melissa supports the allergic community through group and private counseling for individuals and their caregivers as well as through her blog, social media postings, and her podcast. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Well, and, and so, and you're a mom, and how many kids do you have? I have two, and both of them have allergies. So we started with my oldest with more environmental and pet allergies, and some food allergies, but we really didn't clue in at the time to what was going on. And then we had my second child, and it was very clear very quickly that we had something severe in the terms of uh, food allergies. So our initial thoughts were, oh, we're dealing with environmental stuff, what's going on here? She wasn't even eating food at the time. She was a newborn. And so we didn't suspect food allergies. And then once we introduced the first solids, she started having more severe reactions and then we clued in and uh, had her properly diagnosed. So that long, a whole new world of allergy living. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. And we're going to get into that. Um, you're, how old are they now? They're now teenagers, so that's, uh, when, when I say ages and stages, you really go through from newborn to toddler age, and now I'm in high school, so my daughter with the food allergies just started grade nine, it's a bit of a different world right now with COVID, but, um, you know, as they grow older and become more independent, you get a whole new set of, of issues and, and things going on, so it's definitely a journey. <laughs> wow. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's nice to, you know, have someone like you with such, you know, deep experiences, and now you're using that to, you know, help other people. Um, you know, you talk about it on your website, you know, what it was like when your daughter was diagnosed, and I'm wondering just for our viewers out there, if you can give a little bit, you know, of a, just a quick synopsis of of just what that was like and um you know what what your most vivid memories are of that yeah as i mentioned we had some suspicions i have known allergies my whole life i have a mother who is anaphylactic disease and she has food allergies herself so it wasn't like it was totally out of our radar and then with my son having allergies uh but food allergies was you know this severe and 
food allergies was definitely new. And so once our suspicions were confirmed with a trip to ER and then getting our already planned for allergy testing, uh, that was a diagnosis that was really traumatic. And it was, uh, it, it brought a lot of grief, to be honest. I remember leaving that appointment in tears as you have this idea of a normal, quote, quote <laughs> life for your child. And I didn't really know what life was going to look like. I realized it would be very different. So, you know, it was very lonely, too, because there's so much information out there now, but I feel like back then there was less so, and so I felt very isolated. Nobody was dealing with it. People kind of look at you like you're nuts when you're talking about these foods that are safe for, you know, the majority of people being so dangerous. They don't know if you're exaggerating. They don't know, you know, how severe it really is. So it was a really hard time, for sure. Yeah. Um, I can imagine, you know, even as allergists, you know, in terms of the education that we do now compared to what we do 10 years ago, it's just on a totally different level. Um, and, you know, I think right now in our society, everyone knows someone that is either dealing with food allergies themselves or that has somebody close to them dealing with it. So everyone is, is really a, at least a little bit more educated than they, than they were 10 years ago. So I can imagine it being very isolating um, and scary, you know, just, um, I was, you know, reading through your website again, what is she currently still allergic to? I saw that you wrote about her baked egg oral food challenge, which I think is great. I think it's so helpful to tell parents from a parent perspective, you know, I can talk about it, like what we do and everything, but it's nice for people to hear from you. This is what it was like. This is what I was feeling, you know, things like that. So I'm just curious to hear about her. You know, Feeding your kids and that the whole thing, as everybody knows who has kids embarking on that process. And I remember, you know, before having children, how naive I was to that. And I would look at, you know, a family member who was very fussy baby and, and oh, I'm going to do everything differently. And I'm going to introduce my baby to all the things. And I, you know, really top of it. And I had my son and he did, he ate amazing eating him every vegetable and turnips and he would just eat it all and he was this great eater and I totally credited myself at the time. I was like, yeah, see, this is easy and I'm right. And you know, thank you nailed. Along comes the next baby and she was so fussy and just really, you know, struggled with introducing a lot of food. And I would get very frustrated. I think how does she not eat a pear? She doesn't like pears. They're, they have no flavor. It just seemed to me like a no-brainer. Uh, and then I remember taking her to a naturopath, and he said, oh, wow, she's highly sensitive to pears. And I felt so <laughs> I was forcing these foods on her. But, you know, once we got some diagnoses, we understood what, more of what was going on and started to, you know, listen to her when she didn't like something. I was worried because he had tested positive for peanut and um, well originally actually it was only milk and eggs and mm -hmm. peanut but they said they didn't believe it was a true peanut allergy because she had never been exposed and so they didn't really caution us from introducing it mm -hmm. but then when she had a severe allergic reaction at that time they didn't say to introduce nuts until they were three so it was just before her third birthday that was the Wisdom back then was don't yep. feed three. So at dairy, you could start at one. So we found out about dairy. We found out about eggs only because her eczema was not clearing up. And so then we kind of investigated further. And then just before her third birthday, I was very confident. going to outgrow these milk and egg allergies. And we're going to be able to have everything. And I was given some advice to give her nuts for the first time. Because I was giving her a lot of joy at the time. And the person I was talking to wanted to see her on an almond milk as a dairy alternative. Mm -hmm. And I was hesitant, but I trusted this person. And so I gave it to her. And then she had this massive allergic reaction, which was so frightening. And uh, at that time, it was really avoidance. It was just avoid everything. And, um, and that's how we lived for 13 years until mm -hmm. we found the program that we're doing now, where she's being introduced to... Her allergens in a safe way so wonderful so so you're doing oral immunotherapy now is that it's 
It's a version of it called Tolerance Infection Program. It's a precision medicine program where basically they identified what her allergens were and then they gradually introduced similar proteins and then the actual proteins that she's allergic to. And she two and a half years into the program. She would have been done now if it wasn't for COVID, but it's delayed things a little bit. But it's, you know, just been a miracle for us. I get very emotional because... You know, when I first found out about the program, it seemed too good to be true. And it it goes against everything that, you know, we were originally taught as parents of an allergic child, which was avoid, avoid. And so it's it's very frightening. But also, you know, avoidance isn't a life. It's not a treatment, right? You're still living at risk all the time. And so, you know, you can be super careful, but you never really have that peace of mind that your child's going to be safe if they come into contact with the food. So, yeah, it's, been, it's been quite a journey. <laughs> oh, wow. Absolutely. You know, with oral immunotherapy or the tolerance induction plan um, or program, you know, the family has to be extremely motivated, right? Because this is a daily thing. It's not like you get to take a break. Um, so obviously, yeah. if you're, no, you're a very motivated parent and I think it's wonderful. And, you know, hopefully other people can benefit from your experiences. Yeah. Ages good as well because you know I look at people who are in the program with really young children and part of it feels jealous because I think it's been such a challenging road 13 you know my daughter's 14 now but 13 years of avoidance and just all the things that she missed out on sleepover camp and it's you know just it, it was a hard 13 years and a lot of emotional effects as well as the physical risk trips to emerge reactions all of that so I would feel jealous for people who were getting to do this now, um, but also they have their own challenges because try to negotiate with a toddler or reason with them why they have to eat, you know, massive amounts because you end up eating quite large doses with the program we're in. And so, you know, I, I'm happy I don't deal with that, but I've got, you know, a teenager. So that's, you know, another thing with just, yeah, her growing yeah. independent. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure. Sure. Yes. I can well, only imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's <laughs> pros and cons, you know, you know, for, for each, but you know, the, the moral of the story is you've made it through, you're doing what you can and you're helping other people. And so uh, uh, she did actually do an oral challenge to egg before we even became involved with the treatments that we're doing now. So it was funny when she was little, she would be interested in egg. So I would still cook eggs for myself and for my son. And I, she always thought like, Oh, it smells good. She had an appetite for it. We wouldn't give it to her, obviously. But I thought that that was interesting that she wanted it. On some level, I thought, you know, there's some intuition there. Maybe she oh. knows she can have it. And, uh, and so then it was, oh, my goodness. I think she was about six. Uh, they wanted to do a challenge with um, baked a, a brownie. So I baked the egg. And I was preparing it, and it was, it's so bizarre to all of a sudden be baking with things that have been, you know, a biohazard in your house. You're, like, terrified of it touching anything. Of course. And I go to the appointment, and she said in the back, uh, I can't wait to eat the brownie. And I said, honey, you know, they're going to they're gonna break with the brownie, and, you know, they're going to might not get to actually eat the brownie. It's more to test your skin and see what happens. And she said, oh, no, no. I'm going to be able to eat it. And this is the spring. And I said, well, how do you know? She said, because back in October in Canada, we have our October Thanksgiving. Uh, she said, I made a wish on the lucky bone, on the wishbone of the turkey. And oh. I'm not allergic anymore. So I know that I'm going to be able to eat this brownie. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Aww. And then her skin protest ended up being okay. And they said the oral challenge. And they did it, which is terrifying, again, as a parent, when you experienced a traumatic real reaction that lands you in the hospital you know it's it's a whole other the room was spinning and I'm sweating and they're like oh, are you, are you yeah. okay with doing this and I'm like I don't want to be the reason she doesn't do it so if you know you're the professional if you think this is safe but it he did it and then have big things in increasing amounts and it was you know life-changing as a mom to be able to bake a cake with eggs it's just not much <laughs> of course, yes, I can imagine. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have a question from Nate Zhang, and he wants to know how tough 
cost and effort wise is that program. So I think he just wants to hear like a little bit, um, you know, your thoughts on, on the oral immunotherapy program you're doing. You know, there, hopefully we're going to find more accessibility to these programs in people's local areas. Uh, for us at the time, there were only very few based programs in our local area that, you know, you qualify for. So they weren't a certain age and it was only like one of the allergens. So, um, the program that we're in now was the first one that was kind of saying, we'll do all of your allergens and uh, we'll, we'll do it all. And we're going to give you complete food freedom, which is you're going to be able to eat. And just that. So and you're in your ears and just, it sounds too good to be true. So we had found out about the program because we were invited to a movie premiere for a food allergy documentary. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I laughed. I live in Ontario, Canada. Oh, sure. We'll come to Beverly Hills and <laughs> air sounds lovely. And then I decided to actually go. It was around my daughter's birthday, and I thought it would be a great mother-daughter trip. And the flights were cheap, so we went. And that's when someone reached out to me, a friend who's now a friend, and said, uh, you got to put this program. So we found mm -hmm. him, and we signed up, lengthy waiting list. Um, yeah, so it's expensive. It involves you, us traveling internationally. We go across the continent to, so there's flights, car rentals, hotels, everything like that. I had a lot of support from the Cove Hotel. They were really amazing and, and helping us with that. Um, but yeah, it, it's a huge cost. It's American dollars, it's uh, 1500 a quarter for us. I don't know if they're the same, but plus 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 so every time you have an appointment there's fees and it's not covered under my insurance but i, I think for the state some plans might cover part of it i don't really know yeah but it really I, depends on you know which what, what kind of program you're doing some of oral immunotherapy can be covered um yeah. you know, this particular program is a little bit different um but you know, like like i said you really you know you really have to be motivated as, as parents, you know, like, yes, it can be costly. It's, a, it's really changes your lifestyle, at least when you're in, you know, in the program and sort of building up and changing food. They, after their jobs, they've moved, they've relocated. I know one particular who lived local to me, who's now living in Arizona, well, you know, it, it's huge. It's, yeah. it's a huge commitment and the daily commitment, you know, yeah. you're asking your child to eat something that they probably don't feel great when they eat it, don't really like it. And so, you know, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard <laughs> to get them to eat it and to find like creative ways. I mean, that's a job in itself. So, yeah. I mean, I applaud you for doing what you're doing. Um, you know, you also counsel a lot of families, right? So you have sort of one-on-one -on -one sessions and yeah. provide advice for families. I'm wondering what is one of the biggest questions that, families ask you and then along with that what is one of the biggest or you know one of the primary tips that you give people uh, whether it's people who are you know have a child with a new diagnosis or people just sort of reaching out or maybe wanting to talk about preventative measures which we're going to get into after this question so yeah I'm about that yeah, I would say, you know, the majority of reach outs and questions that I get are living daily life, just, you know, because you have to feed your child and you want to do so safely. And how do you navigate once, you know, they're out in the world and they're going to school and they're going to social events and you want to eat in restaurants or, or you know, do any of those things that we did before COVID. <laughs> right. Normal. Right. So, you know, a lot of questions were really practical, like, as I said, when Kate was diagnosed, I had no idea what to even feed her. I didn't know what I, because I was nursing. So I was, she was under a year old. And so I didn't know what to put in my coffee. I'm like, what do you mean I can't put milk in my coffee? What am I going to put in my mouth? So yeah, there's a lot of those types of questions. And, you know, a really common one too is how do I explain this? And this was one that somebody actually posted when I mentioned I was going to you, saying how do I explain this to my in-laws who don't get it or my relatives who don't get it or family members or the school or or that kind of thing so a lot of those types of logistical 
how to live your life safely questions and then emotional questions as well just you know the anxiety that comes up for the children themselves you know how do you balance normal you don't scare them too much but you keep them safe and, and how do you you know navigate that like logical component oh yeah I mean I can imagine that's that's you know what a lot of parents want to know I mean they ask me that too and I wish I had all the time in the world to spend with each family and I don't and so it's great that they have resources like you that's why I was so excited to talk to you um, I think it's great that you're doing all of that I mean really from adversity you've you know created this and people can benefit from it um, you know you had mentioned earlier in our conversation um, you know back then they told you to wait till babies were three right <laughs> to introduce nuts and you know two for eggs and you know one for milk and things like that and so um, I'm curious and just before I ask this question I see that Kasich 210 said that he or she asked a question in the Ready, Set, Food post and should they repost it? Go ahead and repost it, Kasich, and then um, I'll try to get to it as soon as we're done with this one. Um, um, anyway. I think I read about coconut oil, so we'll see if that's the one. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those. That one is from VS Neeringer, so I want to do that one also. And then I have another another question. So we got, I mean, everybody wants to ask, ask yourself. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are now that we have all of this data about food allergy prevention and early allergen introduction and, um, you know, feeding babies. It's just, it really is, it really is very different. You know, we didn't used to have a lot of education about food allergies. We didn't used to know about prevention, you know. So a lot has changed. It's really evolved and it's wonderful. Um, so how have you incorporated that into your counseling and your site and what you, what you tell people? I am laughing to myself because my mom would be chiming in right now saying, I told you so, because <laughs> I said back in her day, my brother actually used to react when he would eat strawberries and he'd get kind of an oral allergy syndrome and the doctor said, feed him more strawberries. And so she used to say when, you know, Kate was really little gotta feed them more of it like oh no no avoidance avoidance so you know it, it was hard when the uh, studies came out of Israel talking about peanuts and that you know you actually want those big things and I had a uh, meteor requests for interviews and I thought I don't know how to answer this question I, I don't I don't know what I would do it's so terrifying and you know I had felt like I had exposed my child to some degree I knew there were you know there were pistachios on the table every time we went to my parents house they just keep them out in a bowl and she was allergic to pistachios I ate all the things that she was allergic to so I thought you know I don't know if that's true and and I questioned it I was you know really hesitant because I had become somebody that people look to for advice I really felt uncomfortable to you know to say because I just didn't know and so that's really what I had ended up saying was well, I'm glad that my kids are past the point now and I don't have to worry about it because I'm not having, you know, more bees. Knock on wood. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm done with that part of my life. But I remember even asking my patient and saying, you know, if I was to have a third baby, what do I have to do? Like, do I avoid peanuts and milk and, and all these things? And, and she had said to me, you have a propensity possibly for allergies, but not particular allergens. So she said, if you avoid all those things that Kate's allergic to, you might have another baby who's now allergic to soy and these shellfish and, and different things. And I thought, okay, so do I want to eat the same thing? So I have allergies. It was so confusing. Yeah. But just having read through everything and obviously now being in this program, I've done a complete 180 and and you know really supportive of exposure but yeah it's scary that's it's scary. yeah I mean that's and that is got to be wrong yourself right yeah exactly that's a lot a lot of the questions that I get from parents are you know what do we do if baby has a reaction and we're nervous and we're anxious and you know what I always tell parents is that infancy is the safest time to be introducing allergenic foods that's why we preach about early allergen introduction we have such good data now that's taken years right I mean that that trial that you're talking about the leap study um, that uh, that was in the UK after the Israel study um, that came out in 2015 right yeah. so we're five years you know long, you know five years have gone by and 
we're still just, you know, spreading awareness and, and we're hoping that it gets out there. We're hoping that everyone, you know, finds out about it and isn't scared, but there's still, there still is um, some anxiety, I think. And that's what we have to work on as educators to really squash that and, you know, and have people trust that this, this is a safe thing to do. This is the best thing you can do. Get those allergens in early and, um, you know, and et cetera. So when I look at my son too, you know, had, they call it the March to allergies where he, you know, edema and he had a lot of clear mucus and he was having a lot of the symptomology that, you know, Kate did. Uh, and he would get large patches of eczema on his face. Uh, but we just kept, we, we were, we were feeding him those things. And, um, and then when she was diagnosed, we eliminated dairy from our house initially. But my son was a little bit older and he said, no, I want those things. I, forget this. I'm not not having ice cream because of her. I'm not not having cheese and chocolate and all these things. And so he kept eating it. And then we would find sometimes he would get a little flare up and it's okay maybe you know ease off take a little take it back a little bit and then he would eat more and and so you know now when I look back I think that was probably a saving grace for him that we didn't actually eliminate those foods because if you're unnecessarily eliminating foods then you're more at risk like of of having you know an allergy later and so that that wasn't the right advice at the time to right. But it was it was the best advice at the time. Right? Yeah, it was based on some observation uh, observational studies. There weren't randomized controlled trials, and so you know the medical community um, took and made, made an educated guess. In in you know in the end, it was um, shown that it it, it wasn't the right guess. You know, <laughs> right? but that's that's what happens in medicine. That's why we do research and and we figure these things out. Yeah. No, for sure. And, um, yeah, you just don't know what you don't know and right. you live and learn. And, and I'm thankful that we're figuring it out now and, and excited. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me just sort of jump ahead here. I'm not like staying, you know, a little bit stream of consciousness just so we get to everything. Um, and so, you know, and also, you know, looking at the, with the new USDA guidelines, that just came out, you know, because I think you do some nutritional counseling as well to help families. But um, as you're talking about prevention and you can actually show them, oh, hey, look, the USDA just put out guidelines saying that you need to feed your baby peanuts and other allergenic foods early on. So I think it's so helpful that you, it's not just like you and your experience or me, you know, as an allergist based on, you know, my, my reading and my research and, and experience, but we actually have this, you know, national organization saying that we need to do it. And, and yeah. so we've had, you know, all the allergy groups have been saying it, the Ameri American Academy of Pediatrics has been saying it for years. So this really is a new era in food allergy, and it's exciting. I, I always say I'm so excited that I'm, you know, that I do food allergy because it's such a fun field right now. So we're learning so much and we're able so to do something. Yeah, it, it really impacts people's day-to-day -day quality of life when you can you know, get a handle on some of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay, so now I'm going to jump to... Daily life. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah, jump to... Um, well, should be okay. So somebody asked about uh, recipes on your blog, but let me ask you this first because you the, the coconut question. So this was from V S Sneeringer. Sneeringer. So I don't know if you're on here. There's a bunch of people on. I'm not sure if he or she's here, but we'll we'll go ahead and ask the question, and um, hopefully she can see it later on the story. But so she says, or he or she, I was told I could use coconut oil on my breast pump phalanges to ease discomfort. And I have been doing this for a week or two. Now I'm wondering, what if my baby is allergic to coconuts and I don't know it yet? Would this be an issue or potentiate an allergic reaction? I love the word potentiate. I was like, is that a word? It's a word. <laughs> I was like, I my vocab. <laughs> I've never heard that word before. Yeah, so this is, I mean, it's a great question. And this was from one of your followers, correct? I think. Or yeah. one of ours. Age actually, okay. and, uh, I always find it interesting because in Canada we don't label coconut as a 
So there's a, you know, it wasn't even on my radar as a tree nut when we were dealing with all this and, and we've lived coconut, we drink coconut milk, coconut oil. We've used it for popcorn as a dairy substitute. So yeah, yeah it's, um, when I read that, you know, I'd be curious what to mean. You're yeah. the so, well, the interesting thing about coconut, like we know it's not a nut, right? It's a fruit, but you know, the FDA classifies it as a tree nut. In terms of allergy to coconut, it's actually pretty rare. Although yeah. I will say over the last year or two, I personally have seen a couple, like I have diagnosed anaphylaxis to coconut, positive skin tests, etc. So I've diagnosed IgE mediated reactions um, or IgE mediated allergies to coconut. And so, you know, the theory is because it is now so kind of ubiquitous ingredient, a ubiquitous food, a nice substitute, right? Um, that because it's now more prevalent in diets, that we might actually start seeing more allergy to coconut. And I do, you know, I do tell some of my patients, you know, we have the dual allergen hypothesis, which is, you know, this, which is, you know, if you have eczema and you're exposing your skin, your eczematous skin, where there's like breaks in the skin, right? And there's not like a nice barrier and you're exposing it to different allergens like environmental or food and you're not eating those allergens and showing your gut those same food allergens, then you can actually precipitate a food allergy, right? And so for using coconut oil and coconut creams and things on skin, will that then possibly lead or increase the risk of developing an IgE mediated food allergy? And it's possible. Um, it's possible. And so I tell people to, you know, be hesitant. If it's working, great, use it. If, if you know, you can find something else that maybe doesn't have a food ingredient you know, try to do that. That's just my advice for people. Although I can't say for sure that if you use it on examining the skin, the, the child or the, or the parent will end up, you know, increasing the risk. I, I don't know for sure, but that's based on my experience. That's what I tell people. So I think it's a great question, right? Because so many people use it. Well, and it was amazing to me when we initially had this um, diagnosis, you know, you didn't even think about your personal care products. So, you know, you're ridding the house of, at the time, avoidance, ridding the house of anything that she could get into and then bothering myself with, you know, almond oil hand cream, <laughs> not even thinking about it, or hair products or, or anything. So, yeah, you become very cognizant of what's in everything that you're using after that. I'm sure. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, like, so, there's certain soaps that have milk in them, right? Yeah. There's just, you really, yeah, you really, your life really does change. And um, a lot of people just aren't, aren't familiar with that. Um, okay, so I have, all right, there's a couple other questions. Let's get to. So let's see. Um, bear with me, everybody. Ali, Lavi, Dad, Akin, Hopper, HQ, Aust. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you. Kasich, let's see. Did you ask your question? I tried ready set food when my son was four months old and he had um, a red rash on his chest and vomited um, on the first day of egg. Can I try it with him again? Well, that is a great question. And that I am going to tell you, you need to actually, you know, I would see an allergist, a board certified allergist, and I would explain to them what the reaction was and then they can decide if they think it warrants either a skin test, you know, or a blood test to evaluate your child and see if they do have a true egg allergy. Um, you know, with egg, it's interesting, but Gideon Lack, who's the author of um, the LEAP trial, the main author, he actually said that, you know, we say four to six months now, and that's within the guidelines, um, and that's what the USDA says, but it's possible that egg allergy begins even earlier in infancy. Uh, but because the guidelines say four months, that's, you know, that's what we say for egg. But, you know, it's possible that, um, that more babies end up developing it earlier in life and that it should be introduced even earlier. Um, but Kasich, you know, that, that would be my advice to you is, is really make an appointment with a board certified allergist, you know, have your pediatrician recommend one or you can find one and have them evaluate. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't try, I wouldn't 
feed your child or give your child anything with that food in it until you're able to, you know, delineate if they have an allergy or not. Um, so good question. Okay, let's get to SingStar2380. I have a seven-month-old with eczema. I have eczema and noticed when I have dairy or soy, I flare up and have been worried that my baby suffers from the same reaction. Can I stop giving him dairy soy formula to assess this? And if so, how do I supplement with the necessary nutrients? So I feel like this is a common question. You might have even had to deal with this. Did yeah. your daughter have eczema? She did. She had severe eczema at three months of age, very, very young. I remember people were commenting, you know, even days after she was born, she would rub her hands and kind of rub her. It was always on her hands and around her mouth. And um, people would come in. Is she teething already? <laughs> this is impossible. So young. And uh, it was it was eczema. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, that's right. I, I, you mentioned the atopic march. And so um, you, you did mention that she had it. Um, but I didn't know it was so severe and so early on. And that itself is a whole other job, right, is to manage eczema. And that's the biggest risk factor for food allergy, right? We know that now. About a third of kids with eczema will get a food allergy. And if they have severe eczema, two-thirds of babies with severe eczema will go on to have a food allergy. I'm laughing again because my daughter is so angry at me because I see children with severe eczema and I'd start talking to their parents and they were tested for food allergies. She's like, mom, stop. Like, you're not the police. Uh, I love I, it. I made the connection myself until, you know, and you're putting all these creams and things on it and you're trying to treat it and you have no clue what's going on. Is it the shampoos? Is it the laundry detergent? You're, you know, you're freaking out trying to be this forensic expert on what is touching your child to make their skin and really it's what's going in your child. <laughs> yeah no that's good I love that you use the word forensic because I always tell people I'm a detective right and that's what I do I tell my kids I'm a detective on a daily basis trying to find out what's going on with my patients um so that sort of goes along with that um but let me okay so SingStar wants to know that uh, what to do because of the dairy soy issue. So it says, so she says when she she eats dairy and soy, she her eczema flares, and so she's concerned that her dairy or soy formula that she's feeding her seven month old might be flaring the eczema. So let me just say this quickly for everyone: eczema is a skin disorder, and it will flare on its own. And sometimes there is no rhyme or reason for eczema why it flares. And I'll tell you the number one. Reason is changes in weather. So change in humidity, barometric pressure, air temperature. That's the number one. And second is rubbing. Just like you were mentioned, your daughter rubs. Anywhere that rubs, if they're crawling, the creases, you know, they're, they're rubbing their face. That's um, another trigger for an eczema flare. Now, can food, certain food allergens trigger a flare? Absolutely. They don't cause eczema. Environmental allergens can trigger a flare as well, but it's not the cause. The, ba the baby has eczema, and, you know, they're predisposed to getting it, and then there are certain things that can then trigger flares. Now, um, if they're seven months old, of course, if you talk to someone like me, I would say, I hope you're doing early allergen introduction and getting those allergens into your baby early, right? And, you know, if you haven't started, I... I you should definitely start. If the baby has severe eczema, then you should talk to your pediatrician, see if you need, if you do need to talk to an allergist, and then um, they can evaluate and help you introduce those foods. But stopping the formula, sometimes I tell parents to stop the formula only if we're unable to get the eczema under control, right? So we're doing everything we can in wet wraps and all the different creams yeah, and we like can't get it under control and sometimes antibiotics and other things that we need um then maybe we'll stop it get it under control so that we can introduce it right so because avoidance if you haven't if you've been listening melissa and i are trying to tell you avoidance is not the answer <laughs> i have goosebumps as you're talking because i'm picturing myself i think like you know, it's it's so it's such a mind game because you know you're you're terrified and you're looking at this baby and you're like oh my goodness you know their skin is raw this might be doing this to them 
you don't want to give them those things when you're afraid that it's causing it. But now having gone through the last 14 years, I think, oh my goodness, if we had, could things have been different? And, and it's just like, oh, again, you don't know what you don't know. And it, it and look at Andrew and how you would ease off and then reintroduce it. And I think that was, you know, yeah. the, for him. And I'm so thankful. No, you're absolutely right. It is counterintuitive. And so that's why it's our job to really just educate and spread awareness. And I, and I also recommend anybody listening, if you really have questions, talk to an allergist, right? I mean, this is, this is what we do. We know about this. Or reach out to Melissa. <laughs> she knows. And she'll counsel you, you know? I mean, just, just, add, just get, get informed. Get educated on the topic. Then you can make the best decision, you know, for you. You can correct me if I'm wrong as the medical professional but with the whole idea of the word tolerance you know when people ask me about you know my daughter's program it's not she is allergic to foods and when they test for those foods you know same as you mentioned with eczema these are underlying conditions she is allergic to things that she's been eating for life. they did her full you know gamut of tests. things came up like soy and you know other things that I think actually coconut did like She's not allergic to those things. She eats those things all the time. And they said, no, she actually is allergic, but tolerant. And so, so the way that, yeah, yeah, the way that we describe it. Eight, yeah. Keep eating it. <laughs> yeah. Keep yeah. tolerating it. The Don't way that we describe it in uh, the allergy field is they're sensitized. Mm-hmm. They're not allergic. Because yeah. to be truly allergic, you have to have an allergic, to have, you know, the diagnosis of being allergic, you have to have an allergic reaction. So some symptoms that are, um, you know, associated with an IgE mediated reaction to a food, but you can have IgE antibodies to certain food allergens. IgE for everybody is the allergy antibody. That's what our cells make when they're sort of fighting off and defending us from something that's not harmful, but they think it is, like a food allergen. So they make these IgE antibodies, and that helps all of our immune cells create a a reaction if there's a true allergy. But if you're sensitized, and you then, so if you're sensitized, so if your skin tests positive to something like soy, now your daughter's much older, so this is less likely to happen, but let's say it's a one-year-old whose skin tests positive to soy, and they've been eating it, and then the parents you know, say, well, okay, their skin test positive, even though they've been eating it, I'm going to stop feeding them, right? Yeah, there, there is um, there is this window of opportunity, and within that, you know, there's a chance that that baby, because they're avoiding that food, will then go on to have a real true allergy, because they're already, it's kind of thinking like they're on the brink, right? Like they're on the cliff, and... If you avoid the food, then that actually ends up pushing them off the cliff, right? Some of the time, not always, but some of the time, and that's when they get into real food allergy. So, um, so yes. Explain to me as well is that you can be sensitized to foods, but you have to keep eating them to stay sensitized. Yes, and exactly. And the uh, frequency and the amount can decrease over time. But you have to keep, you know, and I've always wondered for myself even, I don't have food allergies, but I do have a lot of allergic symptoms that I deal with and always have. And because I have this in my family, I know my mom said I was allergic to milk and eggs, but it wasn't like, you know, anything like this. And I think if I stopped, I would be at risk of developing. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really you know, interesting topic. And yeah. And it's, it's not that intuitive always, right? So that's why that's why I got to get educated. That's why I tell people, right? So, and um, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing in this IG Live. So hopefully everybody, it's all, I can't believe it's 445. We have been having so much fun. And Philip, McCaddy, and Buster, the Melchi, and Kimberly Summer. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think hopefully I got to all the questions. If I didn't, I'm really sorry. You know, anyone can sort of um, can hit us up on Ready Step Food, Instagram, Melissa, the Allergy Mom, Instagram. Ask us questions. I'm happy to, you know, answer them on another live or, you know, get in touch with you personally. 
Um, I'm just going to look through, Melissa, to make sure I didn't miss anything. I had a question on mine that was asking about how common it is for children to outgrow their allergies. So that's a good question. It's um, There is not one specific answer. It depends on the food, right? Because egg and milk are often outgrown. You know, about 50% or more will outgrow those. And sometimes it doesn't happen until later on in life so you know teenage years we used to think it happened by um by sort of mid you know elementary school grades but unfortunately we're seeing that kids can continue on and not outgrow and when i say outgrow i actually mean become tolerant yes but it's, that's that's a term that a lot of people don't know and so i like to just say outgrow um, but it's actually becoming tolerant. So anyway, so that's that's egg and milk. So so most children will um, will be able to eat those, but not all. And then you know foods like peanuts and tree nuts are much less likely to be outgrown. So you know we usually quote around fifteen percent or ten to twenty, you know somewhere in that range for peanut and tree nut allergy. So most you know eight out of ten children will unfortunately not outgrow those. Um, and, you know, shellfish is not usually outgrown, either as fish, but shellfish itself is more of an adult onset food allergy, and, and, you know, that's a fun one to talk about, um, so, and then the other ones are, um, what, what am I missing, so, wheat and soy are often outgrown also so hopefully that answered the question uh, when kate was you know diagnosed they said oh you know probably around age eight back in that day for the milk and yep. the, and uh 15 to 20 percent chance for the peanut so when she turned what does that mean? we went to her allergist and she had said i'm you know unfortunately you've got this raging high you're reacting so strongly to milk. I, you're, you're one of those unfortunate souls who isn't going to outgrow it. And I posted a picture on social media of just the saddest little girl. That you, and I said, okay, shout out to anyone who tell me stories of older children, you know, in their teens, older, who have outgrown this because I don't like shutting down hope. I don't want her to think that there's no hope and people read, oh, 15, 16 years old. So, for these stories of later, you know, now she's at a place where she's eating all of the dairy. So, <laughs> so great. Hey, so awesome. Research and science and medicine is always evolving. And so, you know, these numbers are, like you said, based on what is known at the time. And, and they're not limiting. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I tell parents. We got, you know, so you can be hopeful and you can be optimistic. I don't like to give, you know, false hope. I like to be very realistic and um, and educate them, you know, like that. But yes, you're right. You know, there's And there's a lot of treatments, right? We have, not only do we have just like the program urine and oral immunotherapy itself, but there's, you know, a pill, peanut pill, and maybe some patches. And there's just, you know, a whole bunch of stuff on the horizon. So it's really exciting. Um, I do want to tell everyone that you have some really fun recipes on your website. So if you do have a child with food allergies or you have food allergies yourself, check it out. Um, and again, you have some great um, stories and, and experience and education and everyone should follow you if they haven't. And I had such a fun time talking with you. Yes, you as well. The time just flies. <laughs> I know, doesn't it? That's why I love doing these. It's really fun. I hope everybody else <laughs> likes it too. Honestly, that's the reason why I started the podcast because I would have these conversations with people in the allergy world years and years ago and I think, oh, I wish they recorded that because I feel like people would be interested and, you know, you get so passionate about it because it's, it's such a big deal in your life. So, yeah, no, I, I have always enjoyed meeting new community and it's definitely one of the silver linings of this journey have been, you know, that I'm talking to someone like you and, and getting to meet people and, and really am thankful for that. Oh, that's great. That's so nice. Thank you. Well, I'm thankful that you joined us on Live with Dr. Katie. Thank um, you. I hope that you have a great start to your 2021. I hope everybody does. And we're all looking forward to this year. It's going to be great. I know it. 
Um, so, all right, well, let's stay in touch, and we can always bring Melissa back, guys. Um, we, you know, we have, I'm sure we can talk for hours. Um, yes. But anyway, thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon. And bye, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye. Take care. Hi, everyone. Welcome to.